Tonight, violence in Canadian schools. Our exclusive national survey lets students tell the story. I felt unsafe in a place where you're supposed to feel safe. What they suffer through, how often, and why so many just keep quiet. The Bloc Québécois clarifies its goals. Rosemary is here with that issue. It's not going to chase me out of politics. Plus, Catherine McKenna responds to an ugly slur. And Jason Kenney unveils his first budget. What's the message to Ottawa and to the rest of Canada? Ian's there, talking to Albertans. This is The National. When Canadian parents send their kids to school every day, they should be safe in assuming their students are safe. But for too many, the schoolyard is a minefield. The danger comes from their peers. Threats, physical assaults, even sexual abuse. And it can start as early as elementary school. But a lack of reliable national data makes it hard to know. How bad is it? And what is being done about it? So CBC News launched a months-long investigation. And tonight, we begin to roll out our findings. Now, we surveyed more than 4,000 students and former students about their experiences. And what they told us is pretty shocking. David Common kicks off our special series with the ordeal of one boy lucky to be alive. I'll come out again. Hard to believe now, but Jaden Trudell was nearly killed a year ago. It began with a punch, one he never saw coming. Followed by older teens from school in the first days of grade nine, then suddenly blindsided from behind. Picked him up over his head, slammed him down head first in the cement. Jaden's grandfather has seen the video. His cousin Jackson watched it happen. I thought he was dead. Yeah. Yeah. As horrendous as it may seem, what happened is not unusual. More than a third of 14 to 21 year olds we surveyed say they were physically assaulted by another student. Nearly one in five high schoolers threatened with a weapon. One in four students also say they first experienced sexual harassment or assault by another student before going into grade seven. One in seven girls say they were forced into a sexual act, including oral sex or rape. And yet our survey also shows students who tell teachers and administrators often feel let down by their school's response, including this teen who was not warned by officials that a boy charged with sexually assaulting her would just days later return to class. It's like it happened all over again. I was scared. I didn't want to go to school. I felt sick. I felt unsafe in a place where you're supposed to feel safe. Jaden also felt that way. If you go to a teacher, then you just get labeled like as a snitch or whatever, and that'll just like make more people hate you. And the threats continue. That's why he started grade 10 at a new school. Okay, so, so David, why is it that we knew so little about the degree of violence in schools before this investigation? Well, we tried uh, by asking school boards, school districts right across the country what was happening inside their schools because many of those schools do in fact keep records, but they were in many cases unwilling to release those records, the numbers, not the names of people involved. Mm -hmm. They put it all, all sorts of other barriers. Ultimately, when we couldn't get that information from them, we thought, let's ask students themselves. That's right. how this survey came about. And there's more coming next week in this. There case. absolutely is. You know, uh, tomorrow night, Friday night on Marketplace, we have the full story. We're also going to be looking here on the National at, at homophobia, transphobia. And, of course, you have a piece looking at uh, a solution, a restorative justice initiative. Yeah, it's coming up in a couple of days. All right, David, thanks so much for that. And we have another story on school violence later in tonight's program as well. But we turn next to Alberta, where today the provincial government unveiled a budget it is calling both challenging and necessary, one full of cuts that it hopes will also stimulate the economy there. And Ian, folks were warned about it yesterday. Now they have the details. And Andrew, although the budget applies directly to people here in Alberta, it also sends a message to the rest of the country and to what the premier considers an unfriendly federal government. We are in Alberta again tonight, this time in Edmonton, and you're looking at the provincial legislature where that budget came down this afternoon. 
It's the first for Jason Kenney's United Conservative Party. Some new spending, but lots of belt tightening, all with the stated goal of kick-starting a struggling economy. Carolyn Dunn has the details. It has been decades in this province uh, since we've actually seen a budget uh, that has resulted in a reduction in operation spending. Selling it as the responsible way forward, the UCP says its plan will grow the province's economy and get Albertans back to work after some hard years for the oil and gas industry. To do that, it will drop the corporate tax rate from 12 to 8 percent, making it the lowest in Canada. The government says that will create 55,000 jobs. As you improve the business environment, as you reduce um, the, the taxes within the business environment, uh, it will attract investment and create jobs and opportunity. It's designed to make very wealthy people richer and to make the rest of us pay for it. To pay for the plan? Cuts. Gone is the freeze on post-secondary tuition and some education tax credits. Plus, interest rates on student loans are going up. Well, unfortunately, that does mean that a lot of students are going to face tough times trying to afford their post-secondary education. The public service will be smaller by nearly 8 percent, though much of that through attrition. But public service unions say they're already stretched to the limit. They're ready to take action on a number of different levels already. There's rallies and information pickets all over the place. Add to that hundreds of millions of dollars in cuts to municipal infrastructure funding. But the budget makes a big assumption that at least two pipeline projects will come online in the next few years. If that doesn't happen, this warning from Alberta, it could cost the country $43 billion and 35,000 jobs. The rest of the nation is very happy to receive our $21 billion per year in transfer payments. And yet we get um, a very unenthusiastic amount of support when we have to build it, when we go to build a pipeline. And Carolyn, as we mentioned, there's some new spending in this budget as well. Yeah, absolutely. The government is going to put $100 million into mental health care, spend $40 million on opioid addiction and $20 million on palliative care. And don't forget about the $30 million for an energy war room. That's basically going to defend oil and gas and try to get more support for the industry. And speaking of which, there's also two and a half million for a public inquiry into foreign funding of environmental groups that oppose the oil sands and pipelines. All right, Carolyn Dunn, thank you. Thank you. We're not happy. We kind of feel a little left out. A lot of people out there are hurting. Just some of what Albertans told me earlier today when we stopped by Gasoline Alley near Red Deer. Alberta's message for the rest of Canada in just a bit. For now, though, back to you in Toronto, Andrew. Okay, sounds good, Ian. Western frustration is just one of the challenges facing Justin Trudeau. Another is governing now with a minority in the House of Commons. Well, there was only a glimpse of the Prime Minister today there in that motorcade. He spent the day in private meetings, leaving his office late this afternoon. And, Rosie, we can imagine what's going on in those meetings with so much at stake. Yeah, I'd love to know more about them, Andrew, but there's plenty that the Liberals need to figure out in terms of how to manage things, including one factor, a much stronger Bloc Québécois. And today, its leader, Yves-François Blanchet, talked a little about his party's strategy. Alison Northcott has those details. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet says his new caucus will do politics differently. As his strength and contingent of MPs met for the first time, he said it's no coincidence they chose to do so in Quebec City. Dans notre seule capitale nationale, qui est Québec. In our only national capital that is Quebec, he says. Blanchet and his team say the Bloc isn't going to Ottawa looking for a fight, but to make gains for Quebecers. We're not going there to bring down the government, but to work with everyone, says longtime Bloc MP Louis Plamondon. Blanchette says his first priority is to make sure the government delivers on a promise to compensate farmers affected by recent trade deals. We've been told that it would happen for months and months and months and months, and it did never happen. So whatever the process, if we can contribute to that, help that, achieve that, that will be a success. After that, he says he'll go issue by issue, supporting what he thinks is good for Quebec, standing against what's not. And he says there will be room for discussion. We will all discover that in due course. Yolande James worked with Blanchette in television. She says the bloc could work with the Liberals on some environmental measures. There will be a, um, an area 
that you'll find the block willing to discuss, work with. But as soon as we get to things like identity and language, it always gets sticky. Always. She says despite the bloc's rise, the Liberals still won more seats in Quebec, and now the bloc has to prove it can influence this minority government. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Some news tonight on the future of another party leader, Elizabeth May. May has been leader of the Green Party for more than a decade, but today she said the chances are, quote, very slight that she would be leader in another four years. She didn't say when she might step down, just that it's important for the health of the party that she continue as leader for now, adding she would like to run as an MP again. After the exhaustion of an election campaign, it's a bit quieter uh, this week in Ottawa, but for Federal Minister of the Environment, Catherine McKenna, peace just wasn't in the cards. A vicious slur was painted across her face at her constituency office. We're partially blurring it, but you can probably get the message there. Salima Shivji has her reaction. Just days after defending her seat, Catherine McKenna was hoping to spend some downtime with her kids until this. We've just been through a really uh, divisive campaign uh, with a lot of negative rhetoric. Um, and this is really beneath us <laughs> as Canadians. Um, I'm angry and, quite frankly, really disappointed. Anyway, I am a bit shaken. On, look, I'm tough, but I, I'm, I'm really sick of this. Sick of being a target over and over again. Attacks from across the aisle, the Climate Barbie nickname, Weaponized. I want this to be the end of it. It wasn't. After four years as Environment Minister, one of the longest runs ever in what has become a high-profile and divisive portfolio, oh, yeah. there were so many threats, McKenna had to get extra security. Plainclothes officers in the background as she campaigned. Today, she received support from across the political spectrum. A call for respect from a conservative premier who's railed against the federal carbon tax. Doug Ford called the graffiti disgusting. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh used the words absolutely disgraceful and said women in politics should not have to deal with such attacks. There was also solidarity from other female politicians. I hate the brazenness of doing it on the front of your office window. I mean, it's such a public thing to do and it's, it's shameful for somebody to think that that's acceptable in this day and age. McKenna has filed a complaint with police and she's more determined than ever. It's not going to chase me out of politics. It's just going to make me recommit. Even so, she has a simple plea, a call for politics to be better. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. That plea was an emotional one and it was delivered by a politician visibly drained from the past 40 days or so. Here's Catherine McKenna now for the record. Across the country, it was really negative, and it was super negative online. And I don't love this. I don't, coming to my office, other people having to see this, these women who work in my office, who volunteer, for anyone having to see this, it's not okay. And, I mean, look, I, it's not really, it's not just about my safety. It's just about what kind of country we want here, what kind of discourse we want, and what kind of politics we want. I think it's time for everyone to take a deep breath, <laughs> uh, myself included. And I think we need to think about how we do better. It's worth remembering that Catherine McKenna won her riding of Ottawa Centre with 48.5% of the popular vote. Andrew, back to you. Okay. ExxonMobil is being grilled this week, both in New York State Court and in Washington, D.C. It's facing accusations that it misled investors and the public on the business costs of climate change. As Kelly Crow tells us, many are asking, what did big oil know and when? In this New York City courtroom, ExxonMobil is facing accusations that it didn't reveal to investors what it knew Exxon about the costs of climate change. The problem is cost of carbon. And that's just one in a series of emerging battles for the oil industry. Oil companies like Exxon knew the scientific reality 40 years ago but waged a war of deception that cost us precious time in the fight to save our planet. In Washington, a congressional subcommittee examined what it called the industry's efforts to suppress climate science. Meanwhile, more than a dozen U.S. city and state governments have launched climate court action against the industry. 
ExxonMobil told CBC News the New York court allegations are false and that baseless lawsuits do nothing to help advance needed solutions. Still, the questions are being asked. What did the oil companies know about the climate risk from fossil fuel emissions? When did they know and what did they do with that information? Our energy consuming way of life may be causing climatic changes with adverse consequences for us all. That film was produced by Shell in 1991 as part of an educational series and then forgotten. That's until Dutch environment reporter Jelmer Momers dug it up to show how much the industry knew about climate science. It was very, very uh, shocking actually to see how much knowledge was already there. A Shell Canada spokesperson told CBC News in an email, Shell's position on climate change has been publicly documented for more than two decades. And in Canada, some municipalities are considering joining the legal fight against big oil. The same motivations that have given rise to communities in the U.S. thinking that they have to go to court are going to more and more force Canadian municipalities to go, well, hang on, how can we pay these billions of dollars? Already, Toronto, Vancouver and Victoria are seeking legal opinions. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. And we have more news ahead on The National. We'll continue our investigation into school violence. It's happening, so why aren't school boards always reporting it? And at issue on the future of the Federation. We're back in two minutes. Canadian schools should be among the safest places for young students outside of their homes. But an exclusive CBC News investigation has found that for too many, maybe more than you think, that's just not the case. It's a troubling reality we're exploring in our special series on school violence. Now, earlier in the program, we shared the stories of two students violently attacked by classmates. And right now, we want to look at the question of accountability. CBC data journalist Valerie Ouellette has the story of an Ontario student and what it says about that province's flawed system of reporting school violence. Taza De Luna had just started grade 9 when he was confronted by a group of boys. It was the second week. I didn't know where to look for teachers. I didn't even know where the office was. They just kept following me until they just sort of picked me up and hit my head off of the door frame. Two boys were suspended, one allowed to return within a week. He's in Taza's classes, he's passing Taza in, in the hallways. When we asked why, they said that, that every child deserves an education. In 2011, Ontario enacted legislation to help combat scenes of violence such as these. Schools must now report their total number of violent incidents. CBC News asked every public school board and the Ministry of Education to show us the numbers. We discovered 18 boards reported zero incidents for several years in a row. It is really unbelievable to me that there would be absolutely no incidents of violence or harassment taking place in those schools. UBC professor Elizabeth Saywick says reporting needs to be tied to funding and resources. If the process of reporting doesn't actually lead to the kinds of supports that are needed, then for many schools, it's going to be a reputational hit without any further supports to solve it. This is the number of violent incidents that the school reported the year Taza got assaulted. So it says zero. So although they know that he was beaten up and taken to hospital. They've failed to report that. The Ontario Minister of Education wasn't available for an interview, but a spokesperson told us, quote, it is clearly unacceptable for boards not to report violent behavior, and we expect every school board in the province to comply. Oh, oh. Violence like this oh, oh. happens across Canada. But we discovered in nine provinces and territories, schools don't have to keep records and share them with the ministry. Yeah. Oh. Two years on, Taza Doluna says he still feels anxiety at school. How has this changed your boy? So he will always say, that's the day my childhood died. Valérie Wallet, CBC News, Collingwood, Ontario. 
Now, we'll have stories from our comprehensive CBC News investigation continuing to roll out in the days ahead on Marketplace, on The National, and on cbcnews.ca. Now, right here, tomorrow night, we're going to look at solutions. A panel of educational experts and parents will join me and we'll talk tools for kids and what needs to change to keep them safe. And if you have a story or a question about school violence, you can send us an email. Schoolviolence at cbc.ca is where you send it. And one more thing. If you're a student and you're watching this and you need help, Kids Help Phone Counselors are available 24-7 at the number and social media sites on your screen. Okay, let's get to Ian now, who's watching Developing Stories. And Andrew, we're going to begin in British Columbia, where the province presented a historic Indigenous Rights Bill today. Through this legislation, we are recognizing the rights, the human rights of Indigenous peoples in law. Indigenous leaders from across Canada filled the gallery of the legislature as Bill 41 was tabled. The province would become the first in Canada to legally implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The legislation is modeled after a federal bill that died in the Senate before the election. Vancouver businessman and former CFL player David Sidhu is facing new charges in the U.S. college admission scandal. Sidhu was charged with fraud in March after allegedly paying $200,000 to have someone take college entrance exams for his two sons. Now, the new charges allege he conspired to cheat on law and business school exams for them as well. He's denied the allegations, has pleaded not guilty to fraud and conspiracy charges. And CBC's flagship current affairs radio program, The Current, has announced its new host. The opportunity to speak to an entire nation uh, is something that, uh, that I couldn't really pass up. Matt Galloway will take the reins of The Current in January after hosting Toronto's Metro Morning since 2010. Anna Maria Tremonti departed as host of The Current after nearly two decades in the chair. California continues to turn off the lights to try to prevent wildfires. We'll have the latest on that in 20 minutes. Okay, and next, a double dose of at issue, how to govern a fractured federation. Plus, voices from Gasoline Alley. Ian talks to Albertans post-election and finds out what message they have for the rest of Canada. We're back in a moment. Um. Canadians uh, sent the clear message that they expect uh, their leaders to work together on the big issues that matter to them. I will be reaching out to uh, leaders across the country, reaching out specifically to Westerners. Much of this campaign uh, tended to be around me, uh, and I do hold a bit of responsibility for that. Promises of cooperation, a little bit of self-reflection there in Justin Trudeau's first post-election press conference. But his challenges are far from over, of course. So how does the prime minister position himself during this transition period? Can he actually bring the country together? We've got a supersized ad issue to wrap up this election week. Well, that's what we call it when we add one more person. Chantal Hebert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. And Jason Markasoff is in Edmonton tonight. You make it the supersized part there, Jason, in case you didn't know. Okay. I contain uh, multitudes. <laughs> uh, let, let's just sort of go through a little bit what Justin Trudeau said in that press conference uh, yesterday and what that leads us to believe about what he is going to be doing this during this transition period to, to, to show Canadians uh, that he's going to govern differently. Chantal? Um, I don't know what he's going to be doing. But I know what he's not doing, and he's not building a, a coalition government, so he's not going to be calling Jagmeet Singh or Elizabeth May to ask them if they want a seat on the, the, the cabinet. Uh, I think they will be looking for a way to bring someone from Saskatchewan, Alberta, or one or the other, or both at the table. I'm not sure how they're going to do that, but they do need to do that. Uh, and I assume that they will uh, craft a, a speech from the throne that uh, will be easy for the NDP to support. And, and he, the sort of reach out that he seems to have been doing to premiers mostly, but uh, other leaders too, indigenous leaders, Andrew, is that, the, is that sort of uh, uh, an informal sort of coalition building of another kind? Well, he's certainly going to have to work with the premiers and he's going to have to work it from a much weaker position than he had in his first uh, term in government. Uh, you certainly saw a change in tone today from the almost triumphalist speech on election night. 
you didn't see much in the way of actual concessions, and not necessarily, you, you shouldn't necessarily expect to. Uh, and you also didn't really see much in the way of accepting responsibility for the tone of the campaign. When he said it was about me, I think he was more referring to the attacks on him. Yeah. Uh, and there was blame to be shared all around for the way that campaign went. But he must realize that he's in a different uh, world than he was before. It will be interesting to see some of his staffing decisions uh, as to whether he's able yeah. to put together a team that recognizes how much the world has changed from just a, a, a week ago. Althea? I think he doesn't actually know what he's going to do. Um, he might find uh, more ideologically friendly allies in uh, municipal governments in Alberta and Saskatchewan. We know he spoke to Mayor Nenshi because Mr. Nenshi said so. Um, he has a number of options um, at his fingertips. He could ask the NDP, uh, the new MP for Edmonton, Strathcona, Heather McPherson, if she wants a cabinet seat. Mm -hmm. There's a vacancy in Saskatchewan. He could appoint somebody to the Senate and name that person to the cabinet. He could put somebody that's already in the Senate. Um, Grant Mitchell is a non-affiliated member. Maybe he could be in the Senate. Uh, Paula Simons is a member of the Independent Senators Group. Uh, he could put her. Um, Lillian Dick uh, is, sits as a liberal. She's from Saskatchewan. He could put her. Uh, he might also think of something more creative, like maybe he um, to this is not based on any information. I'm just throwing this <laughs> wild idea out there. Like you could put uh, Rona Ambrose on a cabinet committee, perhaps, yeah. like uh, energy and the environment or internal trade, Canada-U.S. relations and ex external trade, like without actually putting her in cabinet. There mm -hmm. are a number of options at his fingertips. Or you could just hire advisors on yes. Alberta and Saskatchewan yeah. issues. Well, yeah. I and mean, that's an important part anybody, because there's nobody yeah. really yeah. Western in the inner circle yeah. in PMO. If you yeah, don't okay. have anybody elected from those provinces, I don't see any point in pretending that you have. If you need somebody to advise you on it, fine, hire them. Well, and also, and Jason, I'll get you to weigh in here. He, you know, he, he did, they did manage to craft an interesting group of people when they were negotiating NAFTA, and I realize the stakes are different here, but, but there would be nothing wrong with having some sort of advisory committee even that could, as long as you're actually listening to it, that could help you better understand what's going on. Jason. I mean, I think he seems to know that the first thing he needs to do is to show that he's listening, to send signals that he's listening. So whether or not there'll be somebody in cabinet, who knows? I mean, if we're throwing suggestions into the box, how about putting Ralph Goodale, now that he's unemployed, on his staff, have him as a senior yeah. advisor, a personal secretary, you know, a, a principal secretary or something. Um, he's going to need to, sh you know, I think, but people, you know, out here, people, I think, are aware that there's, you know, a, a, he's going to want to act. Um, they know from his uh, first cabinet that he's uh, he's very adept at putting on big shows, um, putting on, doing major, taking major gestures like the gender equitable cabinet, like making sure he had Albertans on cabinet or Saskatchewanians when he could. Mm -hmm. um, so he'll certainly do that. But I think that that's, you know, that's all well and good. But I think people are going to be looking more to the action, the policy stuff that he does. Um, will he be responding to Kenny in any concrete way or the premiers? Uh, will he, you know, he's, you know, he took the sort of the, what I call the red line step, or he didn't cross the red line, and he's, uh, he's embraced Trans Mountain Pipeline. He hasn't uh, taken any steps toward Jagmeet Singh or Elizabeth May's step yeah. on that. Yeah. Those uh, things are vital. Um, some of them may, you know, will he, will he give kind of the concessions that, uh, you know, suddenly, you know, reverse himself and implement um, the uh, Andrew Shear oil strategy like Albertans would love him to do? Probably not. No, probably um, not. But I have a, <laughs> no feeling, you know, a feeling that might not work. He, I think no. he, has a, he did meet a couple of Jason Kenney's uh, suggestions, demands right off the top, though. He said he was not going to do any kind of deal with the NDP, yeah. and he said he was going to push through the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Uh, yeah. So he's already gone part of the way to addressing some of Jason Kenney's. Uh, and, and, and for the record, neither of those uh, statements uh, is caused by the result of the election. This no. is a uh, party that was consistent on its desire to see the expansion done, and I would have been amazed if he had said anything else, but I suspect that by the same token, the regulatory framework put in place along with the carbon tax for future projects is also non-negotiable. He's not going to back off from yeah, it. No, uh, yeah, no, those uh, changes, and, the and, legislative changes, yeah. And yeah. to those demands from Alberta and Saskatchewan, which uh, are well known, it cuts both ways. As it happens, three quarters, uh, two thirds of uh, voters across the country voted for parties that actually back carbon pricing and yeah. back a strong response to climate change or a stronger response to mm -hmm. climate change. So to wake up the morning after the election, as the Premier of Saskatchewan did, and say, now take all of yeah. Andrew Scheer's platform 
immediately and withdraw all of your policies is like telling voters, we don't care that two-thirds of you have just validated a tougher approach to climate change than the one you advocate. And by yeah. the same token, yeah. two-thirds of the, of the electorate voted for parties that supported the pipelines. So, yeah, but uh, I, so the I, left I has, some, uh, has to yeah. take some uh, water in its wine as well. But to, to that end, though, doesn't the, doesn't the job of environment minister and natural resources minister become pretty critical now in terms of who you put in those places? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'd be surprised that, uh, you know, like Jonathan Wilkinson or for something like that, like he's he was the fisheries minister, doesn't get like the environment, for example. Yeah. Or um, I, I think there will be a lot of virtue signaling. There is a lot of virtue signaling with the liberal government, period. I think we're just going to see more of it. But I... I on the substantive point and on Tishaltai's point, it's not just like Alberta and Saskatchewan are very important and they're very important to the economy of the country, but there are also like more people who voted for um, the the government's agenda in like the GTA and Toronto, and there are way more people there than there are in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Okay, I'm going to take a little break, everyone, and it's just a little break, but at, at Issues going to be back for another round. We'll talk a little bit more about the premiers, their message for Ottawa, and what the prime minister should make of that right after this. <laughs> Given the government that we're facing in Ottawa now, we must be self-reliant to protect our future. We will show and prove to the people of Quebec that when something is good, not for us, for them, we will work for it. To some of the messages uh, from Premier, Premier Kenny and opposition leaders, the Bloc opposition, uh, and the messages they're directing to Ottawa. So what's their strategy to deal with this new Liberal minority government? Andrew, uh, Chantal, Alfia and Jason back for another round. Jason, I'm going to start with you on this because it's also budget day in Alberta today. And, you know, I understand what, what Jason Kenney's doing, uh, advocating and, and, and lobbying for his citizens, and that's good. But I wonder if there's not uh, a risk to that as well. Well, certainly he doesn't want to be seen as, uh, you know, he, wants, he doesn't want to be seen as captain separatism in the rest of the country or by his own residents. But what he wants to do is, uh, A, take advantage of a, of a crisis and turn it into his own prop opportunity to try to get his agenda items uh, passed. Mm -hmm. And he also, you know, he's doing interesting things. He, this, this, this whole referendum he's promised on equalization, um, in actuality, it's absurd and would have no effect. Um, but what people <laughs> have in his team have told me, I can get yeah. to that in, uh, later on, <laughs> yes. but, um, but in effect, what he's doing is really he's trying to find these ways for Albertans to vent their anger. He wants to give some out valves that are not like hard separatism or actually people starting to dismiss the maple leaf or the other institutions of our country. People are frustrated right now. He wants to channel that into, not only just want to channel that for his own advantage, but also in places that, uh, that aren't, you know, completely fruitful and, uh, and destructive to the country. He even uh, sort of blamed Trudeau for the fact that he had to cut his budget today. Yeah. Chantal, to, to, to that point, what, what is the danger there for Kenny, or is there any? Is this, is this really what Albertans uh, need right now? I don't know. Of course there is a danger, uh, mm -hmm. an internal danger, uh, and uh, as someone who's seen it happen in Quebec, it's that if you fuel the flames of alienation <laughs> by saying we are we need to defend against the federal government, at some point you may get burnt. Andrew. He's also potentially got future uh, national leadership aspirations that I think he would want to keep one eye on. But I agree with Chantal, you can, you know, you ride the tiger, you can end up inside it. Uh, <laughs> you've got to be careful, particularly this panel that he's appointing to go around and, and listen to uh, how Alberta's uh, place in the Federation can be improved. Yeah. Um, you know, on the surface, that, that seems anodyne enough, but it could well become a forum for people uh, making all kinds of wild suggestions, uh, and I think that bears close watching. I will mention that, that yeah. I, the, the battle seems to have shifted from the current issues of carbon tax and TMAX to these future issues of how will future pipelines, if any are proposed, uh, get built. Now, for now, that's kind of a moot question because it doesn't seem to be a whole lot of market demand for new no, pipelines. No. But that's a, a valid issue for the future, and it may be teed up for some future election campaign. Althea, last word to you. I think Mr. Kenny has to be careful if he really still has leadership ambitions because what he might be doing is creating uh, a, a fire that uh, he cannot present himself as the, the fireman to go extinguish those flames and, like, Quebec and Ontario, if everybody is upset and feels like he is just um, f fueling anger in his own province at their expense. And um, I think that, y you know, 
he ran the election campaign against Justin Trudeau because Rachel Notley is quite popular. And he's still, it seems, creating a boogeyman out of Justin Trudeau. And a lot of what he said about Ottawa this week doesn't really make much sense um, about like auto, not having a partner in Ottawa, uh, blaming Ottawa for its fiscal house problems. Right. Um, some of it uh, will resonate absolutely, but is it responsible to uh, fuel anger in your own province rather than to try to calm it? I don't know. Well, I'll just add, I'll end on this, actually, Chantal. I'll put it to you. The, the quite opposite message from Blanchette today, who you would have expected to see trying to inflame conversations, although he hasn't done that for the campaign, but just the, the complete opposite from what you might expect in the rest of Canada. Well, but because that's not the mood in Quebec. The Bloc did not win on anger at the rest of Canada. That's right. not how this played out. Yeah. It won on uh, having a government that is popular in Quebec City and echoing what that popular government is saying. <coughs> Different proposition entirely. Uh, the Bloc is in a perfect position. The government does not need it to survive which means it can express whatever it wants to express without fearing that it will topple the government. Uh, and, and up to a point, there is no reason why, you know, Mr. Blanchet would have come out with a, a knife in his, yeah. uh, between yeah. his lips. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you uh, to all three of you for being here for many, many hours this week, and to Jason for doing it after a long day in a budget lockup. Appreciate it all. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're talking about what Jason wanted to talk about, equalization payments, everyone's favorite topic. Has the current political climate reopened that conversation? Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And next on the program, Ian's back with more developing stories tonight. Plus, there's only one female premier in the country right now, and she was just elected in Northwest Territories. Hear what she thinks it takes to get more women into politics. Just ahead in our moment. I'm Wendy Mesley. Every Sunday, we go behind the scenes to reveal what's really influencing the news and the world around you. This is The Weekly. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on the CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, we're talking to two conservatives separated by generations about the future of the party given the outcome of the election. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Just one week before the Brexit deadline, the British Prime Minister is now calling for a general election to try to break the deadlock. In order to create a deadline, that is credible in everybody's minds, then there must be that hard stop of a general election. Boris Johnson's proposal would have voters going to the polls December the 12th. The opposition Labour Party won't say if it supports the idea before it knows whether the EU will grant a Brexit extension. That is expected to be decided tomorrow. As for the possible election, Parliament will vote on that Monday. In Northern California, thousands have been forced to flee their homes as fast-moving wildfires continue to burn out of control. Ten major fires are burning across the state. The biggest and most dangerous is the Kincaid blaze just north of San Francisco. Dozens of homes have been gutted, hundreds are in jeopardy, and an evacuation order has been issued to more than 2,000 people. Across the state, preemptive blackouts have left more than half a million people in the dark. And the number of vaping related deaths continues to rise in the United States. U.S. health officials say there are more than 1,600 cases of serious lung injuries connected to e cigarettes. That includes 34 deaths, including one this past week. In Canada, there are currently five confirmed or probable cases of severe lung illness related to vaping. Next on the national. Talking to Albertans, I made some stops along the drive from Calgary to Edmonton today and found out what people here want those in Ottawa to know. That's next. Battle of the Blades, Thursdays on CBC and CBC Gem. Welcome back. I'm in Edmonton tonight, just outside the provincial legislature, where earlier today the United Conservative Party tabled its first budget. We can't count on another boom to bail us out. 
It said the province is counting on cuts to get its ballooning deficit under control. There's no question it's been a hard few years for Albertans. The economy still hasn't recovered from the oil crash, and people here seem eager for change. Albertans voted overwhelmingly for the Conservatives in Monday's federal election. So what is their message for the rest of Canada? As we drove up from Calgary today, we stopped at Gasoline Alley near Red Deer to hear from some of those voters. If you've driven between Calgary and Edmonton, you probably recognize this comfort food landmark. We dropped into the donut mill at lunchtime, and so did Debbie Metherall. She's disappointed the Conservatives didn't win enough seats outside Alberta to form government. We're not happy. We kind of feel a little left out. And what would it take to make you feel Put back part in? of the, the community? Yeah. Um, you know, again, get that pipeline going. Let, let's get this economy going. It's not just Ontario and Quebec that makes, you know, the gross product of Canada. You know, we support so much of the country already. And where, where's our influence? So I asked Lloyd Miller what Alberta's message is for the federal government. Some of the stuff with the green movement and so on, it's, some of it's just really unreasonable. It's going to take a long time. It takes time for technology to improve and progress. So you can't do that overnight. I was the one of 1,629 NDP people who voted in my riding. I hear so much though about separation. Does that kind of rhetoric worry you? I think it's silly. I think that we're all one. We're all Canadians. And what I teach my children is that we don't run away from our problems, that we have to work with our differences and we have to figure out a way that works for everybody. <laughs> Wendy Johnston has a similar view, that maybe polarization might lead to cooperation. What I don't like is how everyone's sort of going to their corners and putting up their fists. I'd just like to see more dialogue. I think having a minority government puts the, gov the governing party into the position of having to listen. And we'll give the last word to Glenn Stock, who remembers how opposed his dad was to Justin Trudeau's father. So you're a conservative supporter? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about what happened election night? You don't seem angry. I'm not angry, no. No, because this is, pol this is politics, right? This is what happened. I think Canadians in general are the type of people that they want to be unified. I mean, Canada is a great place to live, so no matter what party is in there, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. You know, Andrew, some viewers might be wondering of all the people in Alberta, why those voices? Well, they were literally the first five people who uh, stopped to speak with us. And as you heard, they had a variety of points of view. Yeah, you got a nice uh, cross-section there. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, up ahead, the moment next. Canada's only majority female cabinet elected tonight in the Northwest Territories. You're going to hear from the Premier who leads it. Next. Battle of the Blades, Thursdays on CBC and CBC Gem. So this is the newly elected Premier of the Northwest Territories, and this is the Club of Men she's joining. The only woman Premier in this country right now. While she isn't the first woman to lead the Northwest Territories, in many ways her election marks a new era for gender equality, and because of that, it's tonight's moment. The Northwest Territories runs on consensus. Its legislature has no party affiliations, and it was the 19 MLAs themselves who voted Carolyn Cochran as their premier. It's time for women to be at the table. Four of her six cabinet ministers are also women. That's unprecedented. It's all about role modeling. The more women that actually get elected into any kind of uh, leadership position, it shows the younger women and women around us that they can do it too. The hope from Cochrane is that the Northwest Territories doesn't stay an outlier for long. It's going to be lonely. I just realized that I'm the only woman premier. I'm strongly saying for every jurisdiction, consider the woman candidate. We have things to offer. So in light of the, the, the story that we had earlier tonight from Salima about, uh, about Catherine McKenna and the way she was treated today, 
at her office. Uh, we thought that that was a nice way to close the show, that there are moments when women are held up in politics and that matters a whole lot. Unquestionably. Uh, beyond that, I, I think it, it would be an interesting time for really all of us to learn more about the way uh, governance is done in the North, the, the consensus system, the, the lack of parties. I mean, I've, I've heard that many times, but I have to admit, I don't have a kind of deep knowledge of how decision making is done in, in those legislatures. So it'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a big country. It's a, an interesting country. I, I, I just think it's crazy that, that you only have to look back to the early 90s to find the first example of a female premier uh, of a province or a territory in this country. That's crazy to me. Uh, I thought it would have been a lot earlier than that. That's The National for this Thursday, October 24th. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.